Lithuania and the other Baltic states fall into the Soviet orbit uh, in 1940. This is the wider context, of course, of this, of this place, uh, of the um, uh, activities of, of Sugihara. Um, because it's crucially in that summer that he starts operating, which is very interesting. So, uh, from what I've understood, and again, I'm, I'm a, a mere amateur in such matters, I would, I would of course, cede to my... Uh, uh, more, more knowledgeable and esteemed colleagues at FAC uh, on this subject. But um, from my understanding, it's very interesting that it is in this summer that, uh, that Sukihara starts uh, giving out visas. That's where the demand is. This is where um, the sudden rush for people to get out of, particularly Jewish refugees, to get out of Lithuania, um, begins to, that pressure begins to build. Now, prior to that point, interestingly, uh, Lithuania was seen very much, I think, as a, as a safe haven, both for Jews who are, who are escaping from the Western zone, the Western occupation of Poland, but also from the Eastern zone as well, from the Soviet occupation of Poland. And we have to bear in mind, and this, this comes out very strongly in my, in my current book, First to Fight, um, again, the Western narrative just talks about the German occupation of Poland. The Soviets are almost completely absent. So the, the truth is that you have... Poland divided effectively in half, and you have a developing race war instituted by the, by the German occupation forces, primarily the Wehrmacht. The SS is a bit part player in a lot of this. Most of the atrocities carried out, incidentally, are directed towards Poles primarily, with Jews as a secondary target. Um, but they're carried out by the Wehrmacht, not the SS. Uh, and in the eastern zone of Poland, of course, you've got the NKVD, which is carrying out, just as the Germans are doing race war, on the, in the eastern half of Poland, you have effectively class war being unleashed on the Polish people uh, uh, in, in that territory. So if you happen to be a merchant or you're someone who is uh, you know, a, land, a, a landowner, uh, someone with, with some degree of wealth, essentially anyone that isn't a proletarian or a, or a, a peasant, you can expect to be in some degree of trouble. So that's why you have, you have refugees from both sides, Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, finding refuge in Lithuania. And it's an open question as to how long they thought they would be there. Perhaps they thought it would only be a short sojourn and they could perhaps go back at some point. Or perhaps it was a staging point to put post to somewhere else, to sanctuary somewhere else. But crucially, Lithuania was seen as a, as a safe haven, and it remained a safe haven in spite of the, the Soviet military occupation, military forces who are here, which have vastly outnumbered Lithuanian military forces, of course. Um, but it remains a safe haven until that summer of 1940. When the situation changes, the grand constellation of power changes, the British and the French fall, and Stalin no longer has to maintain this, the pretense of, in, of, uh, of neutrality. And at that point, then, you have this massive pressure uh, on the Jews that are here, and landowners that are here, to try and get out. And that's where Sukihara uh, steps into the breach with uh, such impressive uh, actions. So it's a, that is an interesting part of the narrative, because it all predates the Holocaust. There is already the targeting of Jews, there is already... Uh, what you might call a sort of a pre-phase of the Holocaust in Poland in 1939, but the Holocaust itself has not sort of formally started. That generally is dated uh, to the second half of, of 1941. So, Sukihara, of course, the only Japanese national to be uh, uh, honoured with the title of, of Righteous Amongst the Nations, uh, but interestingly, his action predates the Holocaust. So we have to look the motors of that policy, the motors of that idea, what's driving his action, we have to look for some somewhere else. And it's actually the uh, confluence, it's the coming together of Nazi policy and Soviet policy in that period of the Nazi-Soviet pact. So Sukihara is, needs to be understood, not necessarily within the context of but within the context of the Nazi-Soviet pact. Because it's that coming together of Nazi ideology on one side and Soviet ideology on the other in the expansion of both regimes that creates the conditions in which Sukihara is forced to act.
So that, I think, is the crucial point to try and remember. And I hope that, I hope and I think that chimes with the uh, ideas uh, mentioned here in the, uh, in the museum. So that's a small example of how much is going on within this period, within this 22-month period, this period which, as I say in the Western narrative, is, is primarily described as the phony war, the period in which not much is happening. So it's very difficult for us, in a sense, in the Western narrative, to understand a story like the Sukihara story, because it fundamentally doesn't make sense. It's not happening within the Holocaust. We would understand it instinctively as a Holocaust story. It's not a Holocaust story. It fits within the context of the Nazi Soviet pact. In the same way as uh, Molotov's visit to Berlin in November of 1940, which is a very interesting diplomatic exercise. This is where the Soviets are effectively trying to have a reset, as we would put it nowadays. Uh, again, we're talking about relations with Russia. France now looking at a reset of its relationship with Russia. This is Stalin and Molotov going to Berlin looking for a reset of the Nazi Soviet pact. So the previous constellation of power, the previous reasoning that had led to the Nazi Soviet pact in 1939 had extinguished itself. The constellation of power had changed, shifted, the British and the French are off the scene. Stalin is then suddenly very interested in a reset of the Nazi Soviet relationship. Now, how are we going to go forward? What are our next, next goals in this relationship? Uh, Hitler, by that point, is not particularly interested in a reset of the Nazi Soviet pact because he's already looking at targeting the Soviet Union uh, as his next uh, uh, objective the following summer. But again, if we if we look in most of our standard Western English language uh, narratives of World War II, you would not find Molotov's discussions uh, with Hitler, with Ribbentrop in Berlin in November 1940. You would not find it present in the text because it simply doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit, therefore it doesn't make sense, therefore we won't talk about it. So this is how these, these enormous gaps in the knowledge are uh, perpetuated. They're never filled. They never explained what's going on in that period. So it will forever be, unfortunately, in spite of in spite of my efforts to the contrary, it will forever be the phony war, and it will be the period in which not much happens. But we do all collectively need to try and change that narrative. And I've said a few times in the last few weeks that trying to change a collective narrative, uh, of certainly of something as big as the Second World War, which has such resonance with so many people, so many ordinary people who aren't necessarily schooled in uh, historianship and, and, and academic discourse and all the rest of it, um, to try and change the narrative of those people is a bit like trying to turn around a super tanker. It takes a long time, it takes a lot of people pulling in the same direction, it takes a lot of, lot of effort and it takes a lot of goodwill. Um, but we can at least start the process. And this is why I think it's crucial, uh, as I said, that um, Lithuanian scholars uh, need to spread the message beyond the Lithuanian language, beyond the boundaries of Lithuania, and spread the message beyond, ideally in English, to provide those materials to people like me and the next generation coming along who will at least try to tell your story as effectively as possible and fill those gaps, because that's a crucial part uh, of changing that Western narrative. Without those materials, and crucially, I think, without first-hand materials, diary entries, you know, memoir accounts, and so on, without that material, it's very difficult to fill the gaps and change the narrative. It's a very difficult thing to expect uh, a history graduate uh, in, in Britain who is embarking on a career as a freelance writer, as I did 20 years ago, uh, to have any competence in Lithuanian at all. I would hold my hands up and say I know no single word of Lithuanian for which I apologise. But that's the, that's the fact. So the idea of actually being having the ability to access those materials in the original language is nigh on impossible. Right? So you have to spread your word by getting it out, ideally in English, German, a more accessible language. And if we can do that, we can start to turn the, turn the super tanker around. And we can start to change that narrative. And we can start to talk about Hitler and Stalin 
relationship